The Thermaltake Flow Ring RGB 360 TT Premium Edition sports three 120mm Ring Plus RGB fans and a glorious LED water block with native support for socket AM4 and LGA 2066. Superior cooling and a swarm of software-controlled addressable RGB LEDs make this CLC a perfect pairing for your unlocked CPU. Click the link in the description for more info. What's going on guys? Welcome back to the channel. Hope you're all doing well. If you're watching this video at the time of upload, it means that two SKUs from Threadripper have just launched, the 1950X and 1920X as part of the high-end desktop Ryzen family from the folks at AMD. Uh, we're going to be taking a close look at the flagship model, the 1950X, the 16-core 32-thread part. More specifically, we're going to be pitting it against the uh, competing thousand dollar CPU, which is the Intel Core i7-7900X. Both of these CPUs are a thousand bucks, so if you have a cool grand that you're just waiting to throw at a desktop processor here in 2017, those are your two options. So we're going to be doing a battle of the thousand dollar CPUs today uh, to sort of celebrate this kickoff launch. Diving right in, let's take a look at some of our specs side by side between each of these CPUs. Again, 16 cores and 32 threads with our 1950X, whereas our 7900X gives you significantly fewer cores and threads for the money. Um, 10 cores and 20 threads, still no slouch. It's definitely the most cores and threads we've seen from Intel at a thousand dollars. Uh, to date, but uh, it still kind of pales in comparison to Threadripper. But we'll see if that actually makes a huge difference when it comes to workstation applications and gaming performance. On our 7900X, we get a base and boost clock of 3.3 gigahertz and 4.3 gigahertz respectively, with a 4.5 gigahertz burst, which uh, is basically a part of the uh, Max Turbo Technology 3.0 from Intel, which will take its favorite core or sometimes more than one core, I'm not sure, at least one core, and it will uh, spike it up to 4.5 gigahertz, assuming that you have power and thermal headroom. Uh, we've also got 3.4 gigahertz and 4 gigahertz uh, base and boost respectively for our 1950X part with a, a 200 megahertz um, XFR boost. So potentially up to 4.2 gigahertz, assuming you have the thermal headroom. 13.75 uh, megabytes of L3 cache on the Intel side, 32 megabytes of L3 for Threadripper. And uh, one of the biggest differences that's most talked about between these two chips and uh, the platforms in general are the PCIe Gen 3 lanes. So we've got 44 with the 7900X and 64 PCIe lanes with the 1950X. In fact, all of the Threadripper parts that have been announced so far are sporting 64 PCIe Gen 3 lanes. We've also got a big difference in TDP, 140 watts on the 7900X and 180 watts on the 1950X. We'll see if that actually equates to a big difference in thermals once we put a load on each of these systems. Lastly, we have both camps supporting quad-channel DDR4 memory. It's worth noting that all of the SKUs in the Threadripper family are supporting this, whereas only Skylake X parts are going to be uh, equipped with quad-channel support. Um, when it comes to KD Lake X, for example, you're going to be limited to dual channels. So if you're buying a motherboard that's not specifically tailored for KD Lake X, then you you will not have access to some of your memory channels. In fact, uh, half of your DIMM slots will not be usable. So bear that in mind. Uh, testing hardware. On, on, the, uh, on the test beds, we've got the 7900X being cooled by a Corsair H110i, which is a 280 millimeter AIO. That's on top of an MSI X299 Gaming Pro Carbon motherboard with 32 gigs of G-Skill Trident Z DDR4 at 3200 megahertz. We've also got an ASUS Strix GTX 1080 Ti, which is rocking right out of the box speeds, no overclocking involved here, just the factory OC that it ships with, and that is the same GPU we're using for both systems. On the 1950X rig, we've got that being cooled by an NZXT Kraken X62, which is also a 280 millimeter liquid AIO. That's aboard the ASUS X399 Zenith Extreme motherboard, along with 32 gigs of G-Skill Trident Z RGB, at, again, 3200 megahertz, and we were able to hit those speeds on both of those kits, uh, no problem within the BIOS. Now, of course, before we dive into the benchmarks, just a little bit of testing methodology for y'all, just so you know exactly how I went about this. For our 1950X, I ran all of our tests with SMT enabled, so the full 16 core and 32 threads are being fully utilized uh, or have the potential to be fully utilized um, for all these runs. Within the UEFI, I was able to hit an all-core overclock to 4.0 gigahertz at 1.39 volts. I would have liked to go further than 4 gigahertz, or at least tried to, but after checking my thermals, I noticed we were already hitting a max uh, core temperature or a max package temp of 79 degrees Celsius. So I didn't want to run the system any hotter than what I would feel personally comfortable with my own system at home. So that's why I left it at 4 gigahertz. Um, you might be able to find some higher clock speeds than that on other 
uh, review sites and YouTubers. Uh, but that was uh, what I got. We were also, again, able to hit 3200 megahertz within the UEFI. I was using the latest BIOS at the time, which was BIOS 0305. That was, again, on the uh, X399 Zenith Extreme. And uh, within Windows, I was using the high-performance power plan for the entirety of my tests. Um, now, along with Threadripper comes some changes within the Ryzen Master software as well. So uh, in particular, we've got two different modes. On one hand, we've got Creator Mode, which is recommended by AMD for workstation applications and productivity apps, things of that nature. And then we have Gaming Mode, which of course is if you're gonna be firing up some games. Uh, the main difference, or one of the primary differences between these modes is the memory architecture that they're using. So in Creator Mode, we're actually using Yuma, um, which essentially utilizes both of the active dies on the CPU, as well as both memory banks, all at the same time. It sort of just sprawls out, like it's full utilization across the entire CPU. Whereas Numa in gaming mode, um, pretty much only utilizes one die and the memory bank it's attached to before it gets filled up. And once that's at 100% load, um, it starts tapping into the other die and its associated memory bank. Um, that's a very high level explanation of how it works, but uh, the end result is that AMD found that by using the NUMA memory architecture in gaming mode, that they were able to yield about 4% better uh, performance on average after testing 100 different games. As it turned out in my testing, I did not see any difference whatsoever in performance uh, when gaming in either creator mode or gaming mode. Um, it didn't really matter what I was using. And again, this is only because I was testing four games as opposed to a hundred. That's obviously a much larger sample size. So if I would have branched out my, my benchmark suite to include more games, I'd probably start to see a little bit of uh, a performance benefit from, from having uh, gaming mode enabled. But since I did not, I simply tested everything in the default profile that uh, Ryzen Master comes with, which is creator mode, um, because again, I saw zero performance difference between each of those, either of those modes um, in our games. So uh, for the 7900X, let's move on to that. Uh, Hyperthreading was enabled. It's gotta be a fair game. So if SMT is enabled on Threadripper, hyperthreading should be enabled with our Intel chip. I was easily able to hit an overclock of 4.5 gigahertz across all cores at just 1.2 volts actually, fairly low, which could partially explain why our max package temperature was much lower than that on the 1950X. Only 60 degrees Celsius for our 7900X. That was the max low temperature we saw on the package after the duration of my testing, which is fairly good. That's 19 degrees cooler than the 1950X. Um, again, could partially be explained by the fact that I dialed in a fairly modest OC for our 7900X. Um, I, I've been seeing a lot of people hit 4.8 gigahertz and beyond on all 10 cores, which could explain why we're seeing a lot of people uh, complain about you know, Skylake X overheating, but not in this case. Uh, memory again was set in the BIOS to the rated speed of 3200 megahertz with the XMP profile. And we were using the latest BIOS as well at the time of filming for our MSI X299 Gaming Pro Carbon Motherboard. A final note before we dive into the benchmarks, I decided to run all four of our titles today at various resolutions. So we're gonna be testing at 1080p, uh, primarily to expose any sort of CPU weakness or bottleneck by taking pressure off of the GPU. And then also 1440p and 4K, because I figure most people who are buying a $1,000 CPU for gaming are probably gonna be gaming at resolutions beyond 1080p, unless they're trying to hop on that 144 hertz bandwagon. We'll talk a bit more about that later on after we see the results. So on that note, ladies and gentlemen, the moment you've all been waiting for, here are the benchmarks for our two $1,000 CPUs. Not $2,000 CPUs, but these two $1,000 CPUs. I'm sure that was obvious, whatever.
All right, ladies and gentlemen, that is all the datas, and uh, now we should probably talk about it. So when it comes to productivity, editing, and rendering, uh, and you're strictly getting down to business, we kind of saw the two CPUs trade blows. Um, the, uh, the 1950X definitely had an upper hand in handbrake when we were encoding our 4K five minute clip. Uh, the 7900X in that test took about 22% longer to finish its encoding than our Threadripper contender. Um, whereas in Premiere, we actually saw the Intel chip pull ahead. The 1950X took 12% longer, uh, not, not quite as big of a lead for, for our 7900X here, but it did take longer to render that 4K file out. When it came to workstation applications specifically, overclocking seemed to help both camps quite a bit. Uh, in Handbrake, we saw both of the CPUs gain anywhere between 10 to 15% when overclocking, um, which is pretty impressive. And in Premiere, overclocking gave both of our chips a performance increase of 17 to 19%. So uh, definitely overclock. If you're gonna be buying either of these CPUs, especially if you're gonna be using it for workstation stuff, which you should be, then uh, overclocking can help quite a bit. Um, let's talk about gaming really quick. At 4K, as expected, the CPUs are pretty much neck and neck. We're not gonna see a huge variance in performance between the two simply because we are now severely GPU bottlenecked. And uh, because of that, this is pretty much a wash when it comes to 3840 by 2160p. At 1440p, however, we start to see the gap increase. The average FPS of our 7900X fared 26% better or higher than the 1950X. And that was across all four of our games that we tested overall, uh, which is pretty significant, 26% higher average frame rates at 1440p. Interestingly enough, at 1080p, we saw the exact same result with the 7900X, again scoring 26% higher average frame rates over the 1950X as an overall score for our four titles tested. So what I would conclude here is that if you're spending a thousand bucks on a CPU primarily for gaming and you're gaming below 4K, then you definitely want to go for the 7900X because it will just give you consistently higher performance overall. Um, especially if you are one of those 14, four, I'm sorry, 144 hertz gamers at 1080p and you have a 1080p display, then the 7900X is probably the best bet, is definitely the best bet. Um, because, uh, you know, both CPUs provided an outstanding uh, experience when gaming. I mean, I, I had a blast gaming and, and playing around on both platforms. However, if you are trying to chase that frame rate, you will be getting uh, more, more frames per second with the 7900X. Again, at 4K, doesn't really matter. Anything below that, 7900X. Finally, wrapping up with some closing notes here. I just want to reiterate that with Threadripper, you do get more PCIe Gen 3 lanes out of the gate with the 1950X or any of the Threadripper SKUs for that matter than you do with Intel. This is a big deal. A lot of people are uh, really uh, hyped up about it. Um, this is going to give you more flexibility to do things like multi-GPU setups combined with NVMe storage and things of that nature. However, uh, recent news has just brought uh, confirmation to us that at launch, you will not be able to boot off of an NVMe RAID array with Threadripper. This is a support that AMD may potentially add in the future, but we don't have a date on that. Whereas with Intel, you get that support right out of the gate, and ultimately it's gonna be up to you as to how important that feature is. On a final note, I know I've said this a million times as well as other reviewers out there, but Ryzen really is still maturing. Uh, it's, it's so new. The Zen architecture is still fresh in its infancy, whereas, you know, Intel has been around for so long. Developers have been optimizing for, for Intel alone for so many years now that uh, it'll be interesting to see after there's more optimizations made for higher core count CPUs, if we could potentially do a rematch between these two CPUs later down the line, let's say six months to a year from now, just to see if AMD has gained any leverage over Intel in this particular segment. It would be really fascinating to me personally, but um, that's of course a topic for another video. So you guys have all the information now, it's out there. Go ahead and watch all the other reviewers, all the other YouTubers who are talking about the 1950X and Threadripper in general, comparing it against Intel. The more information, the better. Um, but as always, I'm very curious to hear your own feedback and thoughts on this launch in the comments below. So blow it up, guys. Let me know what you think about all this crazy stuff. And uh, until next time, toss me a like on the video if you enjoyed it. It helps me so much. And before you guys go, feel free to check out Bitwit Ultra, my ad-free early access channel for a buck fifty a month. The first two weeks are completely free and you can back out any friggin' time. Guys, as always, I'm Kyle Bitwit. Thank you guys so much for watching. I love y'all. Stay tuned for more tech stuff coming at you really soon. And I will see you in the next video.